Good evening, everyone. Thank you for, for joining us tonight. Welcome to the Avexia webinar series. Tonight's topic, laboratory evaluation of blood glucose and insulin resistance. My name is Christopher Chu. I am the Director of Marketing for Avexia Diagnostics and will be your moderator for this evening. Let me introduce the speaker, Dr. Wayne Sedano, Director of Clinical Support and Education for Avexia Diagnostics. Additionally, Dr. Sedano is the Director of Integrative Medicine Education for the College of Integrative Medicine and lectures and teaches internationally. I will now turn over the webinar to Dr. Sedano. Hi everyone, good evening. Thank you so much for joining us. So as you can read on the slide, uh, I'm, uh, we're gonna be talking about tonight is evaluating blood glucose regulation, insulin resistance, pre-diabetes, and also diabetes. So let's get started. And by the way, this isn't gonna be a very long webinar. We're probably looking just to set the tone, maybe about a half an hour, uh, you know, maybe 35 minutes or so. So, um, so you, we, we won't have you up all night. So let's take a look on, on this first slide. So as it says, glucose dysregulation, hyperinsulinemia, insulin resistance, they're not disease entities in and of themselves, as you probably know. What they are is physiological abnormalities that are gonna increase the risk for developing diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and a whole host of other conditions. And I want you to remember that not all insulin resistance and hyperinsulinemia, which means increased insulin in the blood individuals, are going to develop the whole spectrum uh, of abnormalities associated with hyperinsulinemia and blood glucose dysregulation. So just keep that in mind. But the point, and one of the major points of tonight's webinar, is that from an integrative and functional medicine perspective, when you notice the first sign of blood sugar, blood glucose dysregulation, insulin, dis insulin dysregulation, you want to get on that and treat that from a preventive medicine perspective. So definitely keep that in mind. And the reason being is that any increase in glucose um, in the blood that's not regulated properly, the question is, what is it going to do? Well, it causes oxidative damage to the tissue, oxidative stress to the, uh, at the uh, endothelial cells, of the uh, circulatory system, there's your you know, atherosclerosis, arteriosclerosis, but it also damages the pancreas itself, leading to causing ox via oxidative damage, damaging the beta cells, uh, uh, which is the cells that produce insulin. So when you think about it, we're trying to catch this thing early, glucose dysregulation, and then manage it. And that's really the, the beauty part, I, I think, of tonight's webinar to keep that in mind. So. First thing I want to talk about is when you're looking on your lipid panel results and then you see triglycerides, um, a little caveat here is why I put this slide in here, because an individual with, with insulin resistance, they may have two different triglyceride um, uh, uh, results coming back. And, and, may, and, and what I mean to say is individual with the same level of insulin resistance can have different levels of triglycerides. As you see on the bottom, 140 milligrams per deciliter and another one at 180 milligrams per deciliter. Now these are two individuals with, with the same amount of insulin resistance. So the question become is, you know, what, what's, what's the difference in that? And you know, what would cause something like that? Well, the, the thing that happens is that there's a difference in the ability in individual's ability to remove triglyceride from the blood. One may have a better ability, one may have a slower ability. So the caveat here is when you're looking at triglyceride levels, it can be very deceptive. That's why you need to look at other tests. I mean, obviously triglycerides are good to look at, but a, a lot of, a, a lot of the, the tests for inflammation and cardiovascular disease have moved away from that, as you're probably aware of. And I just wanted to show you the, the difference here. And again, that difference is that different uh, individuals can have a different ability to remove triglycerides from the plasma, and that's sometimes that's genetically determined. So uh, that's what the whole story is between the, the triglyceride level. So just keep that in mind. And with that in mind, we're talking about biochemical individuality of each person. That's that ability to remove that, that triglyceride. And it, when you look at that for each person and then look at the laboratory investigation that we're gonna go over tonight, knowing that the, each person is, is a little bit different and, there, and you look at the lab test, you're gonna be able to prescribe effective uh, therapies, uh, treatment protocols for your patient. So let's do a little refresher course on, on glucose. Where, where is it all coming from? 
So circulating glucose is derived, is derived from three sources. First, kind of the obvious one, that's the intestinal absorption during the fe feeding state or fed state, you know, being absorbed. So GI plays a major role in glucose metabolism and glucose regulation. And I'll be talking about that on, on the bottom part of this slide. Next is uh, glyconeogenesis. So what's that? I'm sure you're familiar with that. That's the process where the, the stored glycogen, which is the form of glucose, you know, having those bonds, if you recall, way back from uh, organic uh, chemistry, those bonds are broken and, and then glycogen turns into glucose and that's going to be able to provide immediate energy and also maintain blood glucose levels during fasting, which is very important. And we know the brain does not like a whole lot of changes in blood, uh, blood glucose. Uh, it requires like a steady feed. So think of it this way, glycogen, it's mainly stored in the liver and muscles, and there are hormones that stimulate the breakdown of glycogen or glyconeogenesis um, to get glucose, ma maintain glucose levels maintained. The major hormones doing that are adrenaline, um, produced by the adrenal glands or epinephrine, and then uh, glucagon by, by the pancreas. Now, the fourth, the third here uh, source of glucose is what's known as gluconeogenesis. And that means that glucose is, th is synthesized from non-carbohydrate precursors. Some of those precursors could be lactate, glycerol, and also amino acids. And what, what happens here, why the body will do that, because if it doesn't have glucose, which is needed for energy to form, form ATP, uh, and if there's insufficient amount in the diet or just absent somebody's fasting, says, you know, we need this glucose, so it's going to form it where we can get a hold of, and in this case, it'll take it from those, those precursors, amino acids, glycerol, and also a, a lactate. Uh, there's also a, other sources as well. The main thing that I want you to remember is that the stored uh, glucose is stored in the liver. It's converted to fats and triglycerides in the fat tissue itself, and that the excess blood glucose found in hyperglycemia, in other words, if your individual is hyperglycemic, high blood glucose, it's going to be turned into fat mainly in the liver and also elsewhere. And if you have individuals or, or, or patients that have been diagnosed with fatty liver, that's essentially what happens um, uh, and is, is the fatty liver for the most part. Other things can cause fatty liver. Environmental toxin can do that, alcohol and such thing. But we're just talking about glucose uh, regulation uh, for tonight. But that's one of the major causes of having the fatty liver. Now, on the bottom, I have a list of a whole bunch of hormones with, you know, fairly, you know, big names to it. These are glucoregulatory hormones. You know, you're familiar with insulin, glucagon, amylin. That those hormones are produced in the pancreas. And then there's glucagon-like peptide one. Then there's glucagon-dependent insulinotropic peptide, GIP. Both of those are produced in the in the intestine. So is there a connection to the intestine? With glucose regulation, well, well, absolutely, because both of those hormones, which are produced by the intestinal epithelial cells, uh, uh, they stimulate insulin secretion. So, if you have a patient that has dysbiosis, you know, uh, other problems, inflammatory bowel disease, things like that, do you think that they're going to have a problem with glucose metabolism? Absolutely, because these hormones are not going to be produced properly because the intestine and the enterocytes have become damaged. So you need to keep that in mind as well. Now, the other two here that you see here, epinephrine or adrenaline, cortisol, of course, they, they're involved there as well, and then also growth hormone. So there is a whole host of other hormones other than insulin involved in glucose metabolism and regulation. So I, I really want you to keep that in mind, that there's multiple hormones influencing glucose metabolism and regulation. I know that was a mouthful, but anyway, so the ne next I want to talk to you about, this was an interesting study performed to investigate the mechanisms behind the risk of type 2 diabetes associated with statin drugs. Now, isn't that interesting? Is there such a thing as drug-induced diabetes and insulin resistance? Well, what they found out, the study, it was a fairly large study. The cohort was about 99,000 non-diabetic individuals and that were on statin therapy. And they, they, associate, they said that they have found a 46% increase in risk of type two diabetes because of the effects that statin could have on insulin secretion. Uh, and that, that's kind of a major thing. What they found is that statin therapy, it deteriorates insulin sensitivity of the cells and can lead to diabetes. And this slice is type two, but my latest research on that, and I apologize for not including that, can also turn into type one with that as well. 
And for those using some natural medicine, you see on the bottom here is red yeast rice. Well, that contains a statin-like compound. It has significantly less effects than statin drugs, but nonetheless, there may be a long-term risk of developing diabetes. So we want to fix metabolic syndrome and not just use you know, pharmaceutical or, or natural substances um, and, and really fix the problem, unless you have a type 1 diabetes where they're going to need um, insulin without a doubt. But we, we're talk, in this case, we're talking about statin therapy, um, weight loss program, the things of that nature it, is, is extremely important. So drug-induced hyperglycemia and hypoglycemia. Like I just said, many pharmaceutical agents can affect glucose homeostasis, glucose metabolism, glu glucose regulation. So it, it's your job as a clinician to find out what your patients are, are taking, medications, pharma, uh, pharmacological, pharmaceuticals. Go ahead and look them up online. It's really easy and find out, do they affect insulin? Uh, I'm sorry, do they affect glucose homeostasis? Most of the time they do. And this way you can get a handle on that, on, on what is going on with the patient. Make them aware of that because you may very well find yourself treating another, you know, treating another condition or addressing another condition, not just addressing uh, the diabetes, other conditions that they're on the medications for. So yeah, this can get, uh, you know, pretty involved, but uh, I, I think you'll be doing okay. What I have here is I've selected some drugs and that are associated with increased hyper, hyperglycemia. And as you can see, antibiotics, I mean, you're not going to be on those. The patient's hopefully not going to be on those for a long term. A lot of antipsychotic uh, drugs will do that. Beta blockers. How many of your patients are on beta blockers to lower uh, lower blood pressure? Propranolol being one, atenolol. Just think about that. Look at the amount of patients that we, you may have that are on steroid and hormones that can increase blood glucose. Estrogens, glucocorticoids oral contraceptives, and thyroid hormones. And there is a definite connection to thyroid hormone dysregulation and diabetes. Definitely keep that in mind. So here's a list of for you. To, again, you should you can get a copy of these slides. I'm sure Chris will have them available for you uh, for, for the handouts. Here's the signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia that you should be probably aware of by now. You know, increased heart rate, elevated systolic blood pressure, uh, symptoms of catecholamine-mediated uh, adrenergic-type symptoms, you know, the dry mouth, dehydration, tremor, anxiety, and then you have the uh, acetylcholine-mediated uh, cholinergic symptoms. That's the hunger, the dryness, itchy skin, frequent urination, and then the symptoms known as the neurohypoglycemic symptoms. And here's the list here on the slide. I won't read those all down for you, um, but I, I think you can get kind of an idea, even blurred vision, that when things get uh, really out of hand. But uh, Chris will get you a copy of these handouts. Just ask him for it. You can get it. So let's look at a, a laboratory test here. First one um, to assess, uh, help with assessing metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance, and also diabetes. You've heard of the two-hour glucose tolerance test. So uh, what you'll want to do, just to go over that again, is make sure that your patient has a two hours of carbohydrate loading. And then you're going to take you're going to take uh, specimens on the day of blood draw versus a fasting glucose. But you also want to consider doing insulin measurement as well. And I'll explain that on the slide coming up. Then the patient is going to go ahead and, and drink a 75 gram uh, glucose drink. And then samples are going to be taken uh, at, at the, of course, the fasting sample and at one hour, two hours. Some labs will do it at half hour intervals. So like I have on the bottom here, sample draws can, can vary, but usually it's done over a two hour period. So these, this is the laboratory results that I'm talking about conventional medicine, not the optimal ranges that we use in functional integrative medicine. But when you get the test results back after two hours, and this is just glucose now, normally lower than 140 milligrams per deciliter at the two hour mark, that's considered normal. Anything 100, between 140 and 199 milligrams per deciliter, that's gonna indicate impaired glucose tolerance or diabetes. And then anything 200 milligrams per deciliter or higher, that's considered diabetes. And that's what you'll generally get back on, you know, on the reports uh, when you're doing these two hour tests. Now, Here's what I suggest from an integrative functional medicine perspective. This really has helped me out quite a bit, and I definitely want to share this with you. This is the glucose tolerance and insulin response test, GTIR test. Really, it's based on the, the classic oral glucose tolerance test and with the addition of measuring blood insulin at the same levels. You can pretty much ask for this with your laboratory. If you're sending your patient for a two-hour 
or, or a three hour glucose tolerance test, whatever that is designated, have them look at the blood insulin level as well, because you can get a lot of information on that. So, um, and I want to give uh, a credit to Dr. Joseph Kraft. He's the one that, that really has been studying insulin response since the 1970s. And he's credited for showing these five patterns of insulin response. And, and the point is, is that you're able to pick up early stages of insulin dependent diabetes, looking at glucose and insulin response, or looking at the insulin levels on those, on those five patterns. So uh, you can go ahead and, and uh, Google him and, and, and get that laid out for you on those five, five patterns, wonderful information. So I suggest doing uh, at the very least, you know, fasting glucose, fasting insulin. And if you're doing a two hour or three hour glucose tolerance test, you know, please do the, the insulin. Uh, you'll be able to pick up early stages of insulin dependent diabetes. And isn't that what this is all about? Now, other tests uh, to be aware of, uh, laboratory tests, analyzed course of looking at dyslipidemia. And I talked about plasma triglycerides, but there's a, a, you'll see this on a lot of lab tests coming back, is that the triglycerides will be compared to the high density lipoprotein cholesterol. And what the, the situation here is that the concentrations are, uh, are common findings of insulin resistance and, and hyper, uh, hyperinsulin anemia uh, when these levels are off. And as it reads on the bottom, the triglyceride to HDLC ratio is considered healthy when it's under two. So if they don't do the math for you, you can do it yourself, but you definitely want to do a lipid panel in that case. Next is that glycosylated hemoglobin A1C. First thing I want to explain what that is if you're not familiar with it, of, of how it's actually formed. What it is when glucose is in the blood, right, it can bind to the hemoglobin on the red blood cells, right, and that forms a glucose hemoglobin molecule, and that's going to remain there for the life of that red blood cell, because red blood cell lives about 120 days or so, and they're able to pick up that hemoglobin A1C, which is glucose and hemoglobin bound together. I had one of my old teachers say it's kind of like putting toast in the toaster where we're uh, putting bread in the toaster where all of a sudden the, the, the heat, it changes the, the, you know, the bread to that, that crusty form. They're able to measure the crust off of that. Uh, it was kind of a good uh, analogy that, that kind of worked for me. So, and then they were able to measure how much of the red blood cell is being essentially toasted um, by glucose, and then they get, it, and then they come up with a percentage. If you don't mind that analogy, so the conventional ranges uh, for a person, a individual insulin resistance, are between 5.7 and 6.4. That's percentage according to the 2000 American uh, uh, Diabetic uh, Association guidelines. But I'm going to show you some things from an integrative and functional medicine perspective that I that functional medicine perspective, excuse me, that is, I like the range to be. Uh, for normal range to be a lot lower here. We're just talking about, you know, insulin resistance, of course. So now speaking of that, this is what I like to see on hemoglobin A1C right here, somewhere between 4.0 and 4.9, because that's telling me what? That the average for two or three months of glucose, you know, how much those red blood cells are getting toasted should be between Six, uh, 68, <clears throat> excuse me, and 94, and I like it a little bit lower than that as well. So I like to see hemoglobin A1C percentage in, in the fours. And let's break that down even further. Where do I like to see it? I like 4, 4 point, uh, 4.6, 4.7 is good. Somewhere in this ballpark right here, because that, again, is going to let me know. This is in milligrams per deciliter. That's the optimal serum glucose ranges. And that's functional medicine ranges, uh, and that's what I consider healthy ranges of good blood sugar regulation. Because remember, when glu glucose runs high, even in the you know 99, 100, it's causing oxidative damage to the body, to the cardiovascular system, pretty much everywhere, even back to the pancreas, like I said. So that's the association. So this will give you an idea of how to tighten down that control a little bit when looking at these laboratory tests. Other tests. Um, I don't believe I've ever run a fructosamine test, but this is the seminar, so I have to maybe maybe somebody has run it. I haven't found a need to run that test. What that is, it's similar to the hemoglobin A1C, but what it is is that glucose tacks on to a serum protein, in this case, usually albumin, and they're able to take a look at that. And the reason you would want to look at fructosamine, it reflects the mean glucose concentration over a two to three week period, as opposed to two to three months with the hemoglobin A1C. 
Some individuals use that to monitor treatment for glucose control. You can do that as well. Um, so I just want to you know, bring that test so you know what it is and how to use it. Now, looking at fasting insulin, okay, when this test is done in isolation, okay, it normally should be around 15 and maybe even 10 microunits per milliliter. And keep in mind that a fasting insulin value does not rule out insulin resistance. So I, I just want to make, you know, drive that point across. Uh, you really need to take a look at glucose and do the glucose tolerance test with the insulin as well. Um, but it does get, certainly give you a window into that. And I'll show you a quick comparison near the end of this that I find very helpful, a little chart, and I use it all the time that I want to share with you. Another analyte you can check for is pro-insulin. It's not done a whole lot, um, but I want to explain to you what that is. That's the precursor of insulin made by the uh, beta cells in the pancreas. And so what happens is if there's high levels in circulation, that's going to indicate advanced beta cell dysfunction. So you can look for that, that one as well. Again, that's, that's a precursor to insulin. So if that jacks up, in circulation, that means the beta cells are being destroyed. Now, what can do that? Oxidative damage can do that. Okay, so uh, or the cells are work, or the pancreatic cells are working so hard due to increased blood glucose that they're getting burned out. It's kind of like you know whipping a horse that can't run anymore and expecting it to run harder. Um, you know, you just kind of kind of wear it out. Next is uh, C-peptide. You'll wind up using this one uh, quite a bit. At least I have. So I want you to think of C-peptide. That originates from the uh, pancreatic beta cells, as it reads here, and it is a byproduct of the enzymatic breakage of proinsulin to insulin. Now, proinsulin is the is is the protein before it gets to insulin, and then proinsulin gets gets cut or cleaved, and then it spits out C-peptide. So so that <clears throat> so it becomes split. Now, with like it says here, within limits, the C-peptide can serve as a valuable index to insulin secretion. So here's what happens when you get te the test results back. If C-peptide is increased, it, two things can probably cause that. One, type 2 diabetes. Two is an insulinoma, meaning a, a, a tumor causing that because it's producing too much. Second, if it really drops down low, two things will do that. Type 1 di diabetes, the pancreas is burned out. Beta cells aren't working very well. Or exogenous insulin, in other words, somebody's doing uh, in insulin injections at that point. So we talked about fasting glucose, which is on the bottom. Just realize that the optimal range, I like to see them in the mid 80s, but it does not test for insulin resistance. So talked about that already. This is just a quick synopsis of that uh, glucose oral, uh, oral uh, two hour glucose tolerance test, just to put it on a graph form, make it a little bit easier, easier to see. So normally we, uh, you want to see uh, fasting under 100. Like I said, we like the mid 80s, optim optimal ranges. And after two hours of, of the drink, you want to have it uh, under the 100, 140 milligrams per deciliter, like I talked about. There's your pre-diabetes, and this is your diabetic. Um, uh, if a person comes in with, over, with 125 fasting milligrams per deciliter, they're, they're diabetic, and certainly the uh, over 199 milligrams per deciliter after the two-hour load. Other tests to look for that you, you might find uh, to, to go ahead and do uric acid. Now, plasma uric acid concentrations, they're higher in insulin-resistant individuals, and that could be due to kidney damage, uh, decreased clearance of uric acid. Now, there's also inflammatory cytokines that, that uh, some uh, folks will go ahead, doctor will go ahead and test for. Um, I put it on here for complete sake, but there, if there is inflammation, odds are there's going to be an increased risk for type 2 diabetes because what? It's damaging the body, oxidative stress, you know, like, like I've talked about before. You definitely want to do high sensitivity C-reactive protein. We know that that is what's known as an acute phase reactant, um, but it's an independent marker for cardiovascular disease, as you know, but it also is that increased levels are associated with insulin resistance and diabetes. So you want to use that as a marker as well, because the two go together. Like I said, if you have blood sugar dysregulation, it is going to damage the epithelial cells, the, endo, uh, uh, the endothelial cells of the cardiovascular system. Uh, and you know there's a lot of crossover uh, as well. This test, I, can, I would highly suggest doing this one, this plasmidogen activating inhibitor one lab test. Now, plasmidogen, it is an acute phase reactant. What acute phase reactant means, if you're not familiar with that, is that if there's an inflammation going on, it is alerting the body something is not right. Now, in this case, plasminogen uh, will, will go up because it's a precursor to plasmin. So what's plasmin? That digests fibrinogen, right? 
um, and that's digesting clots. So if there's a lot of clot, the clot formation, the blood's getting thick, well, plasminogen is saying, hey, you know, we, we don't want to have clots, so uh, we're going to do the best that we can. But this, when this is up, this analyte is up, plasminogen activating inhibitor one, inflammation and oxidative stress are increased. You can use this as a biomarker, and it's a great biomarker in my opinion. It doesn't get a whole lot of play, but I'm seeing it a lot on cardiovascular inflammation panels, atherosclerosis panels as well. So an increase is associated with insulin resistance, type 2 diabetes, metabolic syndrome, and cardiovascular disease, and they all go together, as you probably know by now. Now, this other analyte that I like to stick on to the comprehensive metabolic panel is GGT, uh, gamma glutamyl transferase. Now, this analyte is increased in insulin resistance frequently associated with chronic liver disease. So it's a really good test to take a look at because the liver can certainly take a pounding. Like I said earlier, if the individual has had hyperglycemia for a while, where, uh, where the, the glucose gets stored as fat in the liver, causing a fatty liver and then causing liver damage. So you definitely want to take a look at GGT uh, as well. And the last two that I have here uh, to take a look at for our one is the adiponectin and leptin. Now, I want you to think of adipose tissue as an endocrine organ, if you're not familiar with this terminology, it is indeed an endocrine organ, adipose tissue or fat tissue. It excretes a lot of substances known as adipocytokines, which are, what are cytokines? They're messengers, chemical messengers telling one cell to do this, another cell to do that. They're messengers throughout their body. It's kind of like an email system. And the two in particular that I want to talk about that are related to not only to obesity, by the way, but metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance, as you see on the slide, are adiponectin and leptin. They are excreted by the, the, the adipose cells. So adiponectin, what that does is that mediates insulin sensitizing. It helps. What they found is that individuals with obesity or increased fat, the adiponectin goes level, therefore less insulin sensitizing. So you definitely want to keep that in mind. And weight loss significantly elevates adiponectin levels. So therefore, weight loss in and of itself is going to help with insulin sensitizing. So isn't that kind of cool? Next is, is leptin. Now, leptin is an interesting substance because it can, uh, pardon me, directly act on the hypothalamus to regulate food intake and as well as energy expenditure. And what they found is that plasma levels of leptin are going to increase in obesity. And there's such a thing called leptin resistance, similar to insulin resistance. In other words, it's the leptin's not, the signal is, is not being transferred properly. So um, that's another analyte that you, you definitely might want to take a look at it as well. So you can look at those two. And I have the normal values here on the slide. And like I said, Chris will get you the, um, uh, uh, the handouts uh, if, if, you know, if, you, if you'd like to get them. Oh, I do have more analytes. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, fibrinogen. This one you definitely want to take a look at, not only for cardiovascular disease, but also for the diseases that we're talking about tonight, uh, glucose dysregulation. This is another one of those acute phase reactants. Now, why would that be up? Because of inflammation and tissue damage. What's causing inflammation and tissue damage? Okay. High glucose, oxidative stress, damage, free radical damage, um, and by the way, I was a, if the, most of you all know this that are familiar with me, I used to be a seventh grade science teacher, so I repeat myself over and over again and drive the point, probably ad nauseum, but anyway, hang in there with me. Another uh, test, specialty test you may want to order if the patient has had uh, diabetes and blood glucose dysregulation for a long time is an organic acid test, because that can give you valuable insight to damage to the mitochondria and also give you um, uh, protocols to help restore the mit mitochondria because uh, glucose dysregulation, hyperglycemia, not only damages cardiovascular cells in the pancreas, it also damages the mitochondria within those cells and other cells throughout the body. Homocysteine, we're familiar with that usually for cardiovascular disease, but it is associated with hyperinsulinemia uh, as well, uh, and it's associated with insulin resistance. And we know about uh, you know B B12 uh, deficiency and and um, uh, and so forth. So another one that you might want to consider uh, bundling that up into a package. And by the way, Bexy's got some great uh, panels for you to take a look at. Uh, the, 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 they have a, di a diabetes panel that covers a lot of these as well. Now I believe this is our last two coming up here. Gastrointestinal stool analysis. Right now, why would you want to do that? 
I think you already know the answer to this from what I said earlier. Look, if the patient has something going on, GI, dysbiosis, SIBO, um, inflammatory bowel disease, even um, uh, irritable bowel syndrome, which can be caused by just about anything. Remember what I said earlier is that there are hormones secreted by the GI system, the two I mentioned, glucagon-like peptide one and glucagon-dependent insulinotropic peptide, right? So if there is problem going on with the GI system, right, particularly with the small bowel, it is related to, and there is enough evidence now and research done, the pathophysiology of type two diabetes. So if you want to restore GI function in these patients, absolutely. You really want, want to address it. Finally, uh, adrenal glands. Now, if your individual is, is under stress and there's adrenal gland dysfunction, that is certainly going to be related to metabolic syndrome. You're going to see a lot of those folks have uh, belly, uh, uh, I'm sorry, fat around the belly and, and so forth. So you, you want to definitely do an adrenal stress index. And let me give you a clue here um, uh, about the major, what I have here, the major hormones of the body. Um, I had a wonderful teacher had taught me that many, many years ago. I said, boy, does that make a whole lot of sense? Now, what are the, looking at these hormones first, like even before reproductive and thyroid hormone and all that, look at these major hormones because they are the ones that the body uses to respond immediately to the environment. The other ones are very important, but those are kind of the mediators and making sure everything else is happy. But th these will qualify as the, as the major hormones. So what are they? Adrenaline or epinephrine, cortisol and insulin, all of which interact with one another. Here's, here's how it works. Right, as we, we and these are designed to react to our environment. Uh, you know, stress isn't a bad thing if it's you know for if you, have, you know the the proverbial or uh, you know mountain lion chasing you. You you want glucose available. You want your epinephrine. You you want insulin to get into the cells and and glucose to get into the cells for energy. You just want to get out of the way and then you know relax and have dinner and have a cup of tea and everything should go back to normal in normal situation. Now here's here's what happens when this whole system, those major hormones don't, are, are not in good working order. If you're under stress all, a lot of times, your adrenaline epinephrine is constantly up, right? That means you're in this stress. Now that tells the adrenal glands, um, and by the way, noradrenaline is made in the brain as well. It tells the adrenal glands to produce cortisol. So what does cortisol do? It calls glucose in. It says, we need more glucose. We need more glucose, we need energy, help, help. And then the cortisol going up jacks up insulin because why do we need insulin? To get the glucose into the cell. This becomes a vicious cycle. So if you're not addressing stress, mind body, mind body spirit with patient, it's a very important part of that as well for as far as treatment. And you may wanna take a look at an adrenal stress index as well. Oh, uh, of course we got uh, testosterone, uh, down, downstream uh, hormones. Uh, that, that you can take a look at as well, particularly in male, because there's evidence that testosterone is involved in promoting glucose utilization and glucose uptake. It's very important to take a look at that, male and female, by the way. And vitamin D, and I can't say enough about vitamin D, it has pre uh, uh, preventive effects of vitamin D on diabetes, and it may be due to the anti-inflammatory properties as well. Now, next is a urine test that if you have a patient with known, known diabetes, or insulin resistance, please do this test and order this test. It's called urinary microalbumin, right? On your dipstick, you're gonna see protein on a dipstick test, but it's um, not gonna be as specific as looking at microalbumin, which can be picked up. If protein gets into the urine, by the way, that means the kidneys are not working properly at all. With the microalbumin test, you're able to pick up renal impairment a lot earlier because the on your dipstick, the proteins uh, may not show positive for three or four years, maybe even five years down the line. Microalbumin can pick that up early. And if you see it on the, on the dipstick, hey, you're getting consistently getting protein on the microalbumin dipsticks because they have specific ones and, and ordering on, on the laboratory test. You can tell your patient, you know, look, you're, you're on your way. There's kidney damage. This has been uh, persistent that we're picking up protein. You can explain that to them and why protein has showed up in, in the urine uh, consistently now. Because every now and then you can get a little bit of protein. Uh, a high exercise will do that. Fever fever, and things like that will do that. But consistently, there's a problem going on. And we know there's a lot of people on a waiting list for kidney uh, replacement and on dialysis. So you're looking to pick that up early. Now, with type 1 diabetes, this is the... Uh, 
the diabetes-related autoantibody testing, some tests that you want to consider. The one I have put in red is the one that is basically positive uh, for the, the most part and the most common, and that is the glutamic acid decarboxylase, decarboxylase autoantibodies. If you don't order um, uh, all of these tests, definitely order that one. That's the one that's most consistent, meaning that there's damage going on leading you know, to those autoantibodies uh, to, to the pancreas. The other is the islet cell cytoplasmic autoantibodies, insulin autoantibodies, and insulin OMA2 associated autoantibodies. So these are the tests laid out for you that you may want to consider. All right, so let's kind of wrap this up. We're getting close to the end. Hopefully I'm not speaking too fast here, but <clears throat> let's think about diabetes and metabolic syndrome. It's all kind of related. For, of course, there's genetics, biochemical individuality, and acquired conditions. So what are some of the acquired conditions that lead to this? Obesity, Second, sedentary lifestyle, nutritional deficiencies, increase in, in, in free fatty acids, that all leads to insulin resistance. So what is insulin resistance that we've talked about? Well, that means that the body produces insulin, of course, to help glucose get into the cells, but the cells, membranes of the cells of our body are not responding to it. They're not opening the door to let glucose in so it can turn into ATP go through glycolysis and the Krebs cycle and oxidative phosphorylation to, to eventually get ATP. You, you probably should be familiar with that. So all of a sudden the insulin's not working. It's resistance to, to its working. Now, remember that there are receptors on all the cells of our body. There's insulin receptors there. If the, if the cell membrane is not working properly, which can be due to by environmental toxins, margarine is a big one, by the way, Way when the big margarine thing that hopefully we're not seeing any we're not seeing any more commercials on that that is a trans fat that can gum up the works of the cell membrane damaging receptors something to think about so now from insulin resistance when we have that with all of the you know the acquired uh, that leads to hyperinsulinemia in other words insulin is now high when you do your laboratory test and then you're going to get compensated insulin resistance um, there's going to be impaired glucose is going to <clears throat> start to go up because the compensated insulin resistance mean is that more insulin is being dumped in so it's going to keep glucose level normal that's where you can have insulin resistance yet a normal glucose glucose tolerance because insulin's been jacked up they're just throwing you know more more wood onto the fire here but eventually it's going to lead to an impairment of the optimal fasting glucose the hemoglobin a1c is going to go up and then eventually you're going to get the impaired glucose tolerance uh, test and then eventually keep going pancreatic beta cell failure and that's due to what some of it could be genetics of course but there could be glucose toxicity which which is caused by meaning glucose is toxic causes oxidative damage mitochondrial damage disease and that leads to an increase uh, damage to the pancreas and also uh, damage uh, damage to the liver as well all leading to type 2 diabetes that's just a little schematic for you to take a look at here, here's a chart that I use uh, quite a bit, uh, just comparing if you only do two uh, analytes, you can get a lot of information out, at, uh, out of this, just looking at fasting glucose and then fasting insulin. Okay. Hopefully, normally, they should both be in a normal range, and that's pretty good if you don't do a, a glucose tolerance test. But if you happen to see where um, insulin is increased right, on that fasting test, and glucose could be normal, maybe a little bit increased. Uh-oh, insulin resistance is starting. Right? Now, if you see that glucose is greatly increased, right, and insulin starts going down, right, decreased production of insulin, what is that telling you? Diabetes, pancreatitis, could be cystic fibrosis, pancreatic cancers, hypopituitarism. Right? And then if you get all the way down to the bottom here, normal to greatly increased insulin at fasting and decreased <clears throat> fasting glucose that could be hypoglycemia due to excessive insulin could be an insulinoma cushing's disease or they're taking too much injection of exogenous insulin so that's kind of a quick chart that you can refer to <clears throat> without looking at you know doing the two hour glucose and insulin or three hour but i, I suggest doing that as well here's just another comparison chart like for your notes to really put this in perspective if you have a patient with a uh, uh, you know, 5.0, they're basically holding 90 milligrams per deciliter average uh, blood glucose, the highs and lows over the over two or three months. If you see it getting towards six, uh, 6 6.0, it means 120. They're in the diabetic range of getting very close, which is 120 fasting. 
So um, uh, definitely you want to take a look at that as well. So they're starting to hit that. That's where they come up with these ranges. This is just a scale uh, for your charts for, for edification. Now here's um, got just a few more slides left and I wanna thank you so much for your patience. These are factors that increase the likelihood of insulin resistance. <clears throat> Most of these you already know about, certainly diagnosis of cardiovascular disease, hypertension, polycystic ovarian syndrome, that is definitely related. If you have an individual with, with a PCOS, you got it. You have to look at them for for diabetes um, and insulin resistance because that's really one of the, the big things. Next is non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. I talked about that and showed you how that is uh, accomplished pretty much by hyperinsulinemia or hyperglucose, hyperglycemia. Excuse me, because the excess of glucose goes into the liver, causes a fatty liver, not due to alcoholism, and causes damage. And, and of course, one of the, the skin you'll get uh, acanthus uh, nigricans. And if there's a, fa a family history. Certainly, that increases the likelihood. History of gestational diabetes or glucose intolerance, non-Caucasian ethnicity, there's a tendency to have more likelihood, so you want to screen a little bit better. Sedentary lifestyle, that's what you get on your history. Body mass index, weight circumference, uh, that gets elevated or over 40. All of these are indications that increase the likelihood of insulin resistance and would require you to do you know, good physical exam and definitely do some, some blood work on those patients. Uh, find out what's going on and and treat them. So, um, yep, here's some uh, Avexia, by the way. They started a nutraceutical brand. Uh, we started not, not not too long ago, and there are some cases you need some uh, <clears throat> supplementation, some wonderful supplements, glucose balance, metabolic essentials, some vitamin D, essential uh, coenzyme Q10. It's going to help with mitochondria, antioxidants, and, cer and certainly magnesium, which is needed for um, a, a glucose a glucose metabolism, without a doubt. Next, Chris, are you there? Yes, it's at this time. I'm going to turn this over to you so you can show folks how to navigate through this. And I want to thank you so much for listening. Oh, Next, absolutely. All yours. Um, so, <laughs> so um, obviously, um, if you have, you want to look for the uh, diabetes panel, which is a blood panel that Dr. Zana suggested, um, you just log into your Avexia account, uh, go to Avexia link. Um, find your patient or add a new patient. Um, obviously, add to your order. Uh, font, you'll use the test search um, menu to find the panel in step three. And then step four, you know, preview your order and confirm. It's uh, that simple. Um, as well as uh, about the nutraceuticals, uh, you can find those in the Avexia store, which is currently marked as Avexia shopping cart, but uh, that's just a, a typo that we're, we're correcting currently. Um, so, and uh, please feel free to contact us um, if you have any questions. If you'd like tonight's slides, um, just email us at info at avexiadiagnostics.com or currently if you'd like to type in the questions area and requesting the slides, I'll make sure that I get them to you tomorrow uh, through an email as a PDF. Um, and uh, again, ho hope you enjoyed the webinar and thank you, Dr. Sedano. That was very educational and, and uh, interesting. Thank you so much, Chris. Everybody have a great night. Thank you for uh, joining us. Bye-bye.